I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. I don't like when money rents real estate in my head. It's like this totally useless thing, taking up too much of my time, energy, sleep. People don't think this way. You want to keep psychological stress low, and you want to be diversified, which also means you can't put too much in any one investment. In general, it's more about staying in the game, being diversified across many hands, and information gathering. I know probably at the highest professional levels, it's a whole different kind of game, but you know, just in general, club play, or it's, you, could, you, could, you could roughly use strategies like that. It's really fascinating what you're talking about with the psychological implications of investing and poker. Actually, I gave a talk at Word in uh, Philadelphia, and one of your points that from one of your blogs came up as, I always love this point, uh, you talk about negotiating and about how it's very powerful in negotiating to give a very precise number, so rather than like, you know, fall prey to unit bias and say like, I charge like 1K for this, you give like a very specific number, and I think that you see this in poker too. I just always love that point about the precision of negotiating. I mean, it, people say keep the you know work on the psychology, keep the psychology out of your poker playing or out of investing. But the bigger the stakes, the more psychology is in there, and it's hard to practice psychology in high stakes situations. I was so happy to go on my friend Jen Shahadi's podcast that I'm doing something very special and unique for me. First off, Jen Shahadi, I've known her and her brother for 20 or 30 years. She was the U.S. Women's Chess Champion. She's also a professional poker player. Greg Shahadi is one of the best chess players in the country. We've been playing chess for so long, I feel like since we were all kids. But now, Jen has a podcast about poker. So not only did I play chess very actively when I was younger, I played poker semi-professionally for a while, and she invited me onto her podcast. And we had such a fun conversation about life, business, games, and how they're all related to each other, how, how to think about poker in a way that's related to business. And it was such a different type of conversation for me, and it was so much fun. And I asked her, Jen, after you air this on your podcast, can we put the same recording on my podcast? She said, yes. Thank you, Jen. You should all check out her excellent podcast, The Poker Grid, and listen to this podcast to see how it goes. You'll see me having extra fun. So listen along. 
Dealer, I'm feeling it hit me. Welcome to The Grid. I am your host, Jennifer Shahadi, and we'll be taking a 13 by 13 episode journey through every possible No Limit Hold'em hand, 169 hands in total, from aces to seven deuce offsuit. Each episode, I'll interview another top poker player or personality about their hand. Once a combo is taken, it's gone. So this podcast will become progressively more difficult as hands like Ace King are in move from the grid. Whether you spend hours pouring over grids as you study poker, love to listen to hand history pods while grinding cash, or are just interested in absurd scavenger hunts, we're going to have some fun. You got the cards. Dealer, I'm feeling it hit me. Yeah, I got swagger. They see me, see me strutting. Welcome back to the Poker Grid. I am so happy to introduce to you today James Altucher, who is with me live in New York, and we're actually recording at your comedy club. It's so awesome to I'm be. so glad you came up here because I don't like to move more than 100 feet from where I live, so I make sure all my professional activities happen within one block. It's fantastic. Stand up New York, and we're here in your podcast studio. Um, you are, of course, a podcast host, entrepreneur, author of 20 books, including Choose Yourself and The Side Hustle Bible. I mean, I follow James' work on jamesabsuture.com for so many years, and I've been particularly inspired by a lot of his thoughts on multiple income streams, which is really important to chess and poker players, and also by your writing tips. But a lot of things that people don't know about you who follow you is that you're very passionate about games and you're actually a U.S. chess master and you played poker professionally for a little while. Yeah, and um, by the way, I remember in, I think it was, I forget what year, you would remember what year, maybe 2012 uh, or 2013, you wrote the excellent book, Play Like a Girl, and you signed it for my daughters and sent it to me. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. I, think, I think I analyzed the games more than they did, to be fair. But thank you anyway for the, the gesture to them. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that was really awesome that you liked that book so much. But yeah, it's true. Play Like a Girl, even though it was, you know, with the title, it was intended for young girls to get them inspired in chess. I also found lots of... Um, adults and, of course, boys getting a lot from the book because there were some pretty high-level problems in there. You're good at writing this analysis of these games. So it was, uh, and you could, it, it showed your love for the game and your love for these girls who were rising up. So I appreciated the book. Well, thank you so much. And today I'm going to talk to James about 8-5 offsuit. And it's a really great hand to pick because it's not an easy one. I am endeavoring on this podcast to click off every single cell in the 169 cell grid and we're on uh, about episode 20 now and so people are starting to try to get those like aces kings and queens hands so it's really nice that you suggested eight five offsuit um yeah james tell us why you picked this hand for the grid so i think obviously as everyone knows Every situation depends on the people around the table, whether you're playing limit or no limit. So when I was playing really heavily, like there was one period where I played eight hours a night for 365 straight days. Like I did not take one day off, including the day my daughter was born. Do you know Ingrid who used to deal at the Mayfair? She deals at a lot of clubs around town now. Anyway, she would not let me in the club that night because she said, you go back to, to your, your baby. And I'm like, no, they're all knocked out with heroin or whatever. I'm gonna, I wanna play poker. So she let me in. It was the only time I ever played seven card uh, high-low. So oh, you're saying that your your wife at the time was had probably, just, it had gotten it up into her. Yeah, so yeah, she and, was and all... she was knocked out. The kid was knocked out. And so I'm not going to sit around the hospital. Uh, people don't die in hospitals. I just wanted to go play poker. And they fixed me a nice meal at the Mayfair, played high-low, never played it before, had a great evening. So it was, it was all good. At the time at the Mayfair, this is 1999, at the time, No Limit hadn't yet reached the popularity it reached when... Um, you know, TV poker wasn't popular yet. There wasn't the the camera, the table camera for for hands. So No Limit wasn't popular yet. And whenever the Mayfair tried to have No Limit, uh, so many people would go broke that they had to stop have, playing No Limit games. So was, most of the games were were limit only. I would play eight five. In general, I was a fairly tight player, but I wanted to have one hand that would trigger. Like I would look at it as if and play it as if it were two aces. So and for me, for whatever reason, eight five offsuit was that hand. If I got dealt eight five offsuit, no matter how much of my body was screaming to just fold instantly, I would play it at least pre flop 
as if I had two aces in my hand. You know, in limits, it's it, you're not worried about someone going all in on you. So if someone raised, re-raised, I would triple raise as if, again, I had aces. And then after the flop came, it, w it would be up in the air how I would play, but I'd still mostly try to play it like a good hand and not just an awful hand like 8-5 offsuit. So that's the reason I picked 8-5 offsuit. And in No Limit, I, I do the same thing unless someone goes all in and then I'm like, all right, I have an 8-5 offsuit. I'm not, there's no bluffing here. Right, totally understandable. And that makes a lot of sense that you need to kind of inject this unpredictability into your game. Um, but 8-5 offsuit, did people know that was a, this your hand? Because obviously that could create some issues if people know this is the James outsuit your hand and 6-7-9 comes up. No, because I, like, I didn't get dealt it enough that... Uh -huh. Like if, it were, if I got dealt it four times in a night, people would say, oh, what do you have? Eight, five offsuit. But in general, I was fairly tight. So if I was, I would play good hands aggressively and I'd just stay out of the way on weekends, particularly if it was like eight or nine people at the table, then there's no sense in playing differently. You know, at one of these clubs, someone's always going to uh, be just as aggressive as you if you have a good hand and you could win money that way. But with eight, five offsuit was the one chance where I could like mix it up and people, I didn't play it enough. I didn't get, get it dealt enough that people would catch on, you know. 8-5 offsuit should lose most hands. If you have two lower cards, like if you have a 6-4, then maybe you have 60, 65% chance of winning. If you have one higher card and one lower card, like let's say queen two, queen two offsuit, maybe it's like a 40, 45% chance. I, I, don't, I never really knew the odds. Uh, this, that's like your best case scenarios for 8-5 offsuit. But if you have an 8-5 offsuit and either, you have two opportunities to win, either you're gonna win via the bluff uh, pre-flop or on the flop if, if people have, have nothing, or you're going to win huge if the, if the flop comes out in your favor because you were playing as if you had two aces. You were representing two aces or two kings or some other high hand. And then if 5-5-2 five, five, comes out, no one expects you to have a two or a five. And so you could win huge. People will think you're bluffing if you bet then. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really, it is important to get some bluffs in your game. Um, you'd be really interested in the way that poker theory has developed today as it's such a different world, so scientific, where people have these things called mixed strategies, where in order to inject predictability, unpredictability into their game, they try to create random number generators in their head and then just take like, you know, 10% of each, you know, even less, like 5% of each garbage hand to sometimes play, usually the suited garbage. But that way, they're like literally as unpredictable as possible. But as you probably know from like, you know, rock, paper, scissors, it's way, way harder to um, create a random number generator in your head than you might think. Well, and also it, it's, it's more important to do that, not necessarily for poker strategy reasons, but because of how poker has evolved. I can look up many of your hands and databases and see what kind of cards people play. No one was studying my game to, to beat me. <laughs> like it wasn't, it wasn't like we were playing for millions of dollars at the Mayfair Club. It was just you know, mostly friendly, even though it could be fairly high stakes. And, you know, I w it was not like eight, five offsuit was essentially my random number generator. Right. No. I, I would get dealt that every, you know, one in 200 hands, roughly, which is just a couple of days, you know, every couple of days I'd get dealt it, but nobody would remember like, oh, so because most of the time too, I wouldn't have to show the cards. So I'm either folding or bluffing and winning. That's the the typical outcome with that hand. Yeah, no, absolutely. And people do still do that today, that they decide that they're going to bluff with, you know, suited wheel hands of a certain suit. And they pre-decide that morning so that they don't chicken out. Because that's the problem. Yeah. Sometimes people, like, they want to be unpredictable, but then they, like, 20% of the time, but then they chicken out and make it 0%. So is there a hand with 8-5 offsuit that you specifically remember that you either lost a lot of money in or won a lot of money in at the Mayfair? I, what I remember most of all is that fear or, uh, that, that desire to chicken out because you always want to chicken out. You're playing 8-5 offsuit. The first guy off the blinds raises, then the next guy re-raises, and then it's to me. So someone's got a big hand probably, and I have 8-5 offsuit, but I promised myself I have to treat it like aces. So I've got to probably, you know, depending again a little on the circumstances, I have to re-raise again and then have them check to me on the flop so I am in more control in, in that particular situation. So that's what happened. So in this one hand that I'm thinking of, this guy who I knew, everybody knew was like, he was a super, super tight player, but he was largely successful at it. Like, you know, at any given night at the Mayfair, there might be loose players, tight players. This guy was super tight to pick up the money from the uh, more loose players. So he pre-flop, he, he raised, everybody folded, he raised, I raised him, he raised me back, I raised again, it was limit. And the flop came like ace, nothing, nothing. And I figured... 
I don't know. He, he he bet out, but I figured there was something about he wasn't like he didn't seem that happy, and I knew he was super tight, so I figured he either had aces or kings or queens, something like that. And so he he bet out. I raised because an ace came out, and I'm pretending to have two aces. And then he mucked his hand, but showed the hand it was two queens. And then I showed him the eight five, and he lost his mind. So for the rest of that night, he was. He was damaged goods and and couldn't play. And you didn't have anything on the flop, like you didn't even have like a straight draw or an eight or a five. Nothing. But that that's the great thing about an eight five though too is that as opposed to like let's say a queen two with an eight five, there is potential you get some play on the flop. Like if everybody's betting hard pre flop, so you they're representing all high hands, and then like I don't know a a four six seven comes out. No, or that's too obvious, but like, let's say just nine, eight, seven comes out. Nobody knows what to do if I'm betting aggressively. I've got middle pair. They have two high cards. I think what's valuable about this is just a lot of poker players make money from playing a very tight style. And the ones that play super aggressively and bluff too much end up losing all their money. So it's really hard to find a poker player, even though it's a deceptively simple game, it's hard to find somebody who combines that um, aggression at key moments with the right amount of conservatism. Usually it's one or the other. I mean, that's why the game is difficult. Most of the time when you bluff, it's because maybe it's a semi-bluff and you have some sense of the people at the table after a few hours. But in general, for obviously this is basic, but if a lot of people are in, a lot of people are at the table, you just, you don't want to bluff at all. So that's why it helps to have one or two hands where you know in advance you're going to play aggressively. If, if the flop came out ace, king, queen, and then three people bet in front of me, of course I'm going to fold because someone's got a hand and there's zero chance I'm going to bluff them out. It would just be stupid to, to stay in the hand. But there's a lot of opportunities where, you know, particularly if there's not that many people in the hand, you know, a, a flop could come out pretty randomly and you could still either pretend to have aces and do well, or maybe the 8-5 now is working for you. Um, in your career advising people about finance and investments, especially regular people who aren't part of the, the finance world, um, do you also find that people have a lot of difficulty calibrating their aggression so that they are aggressive in the right spots? Um, but also just don't go nuts investing in things that they can't afford. Yeah, I always tell people, and this is related to money management in poker. I mean, money management in poker is often a good metaphor for money management in investing. And investing can include not just the stock market, but investing in private companies or even investing in your own activities and time and so on. You make more money the smaller you invest. I mean, it, people say keep the, you know, work on the psychology, keep the psychology out of your poker playing or out of investing. But the bigger the stakes, the more psychology is in there. And it's hard to practice psychology in high stakes situations because you're not often in a situation where mm -hmm. everybody's all in. This is a make or break kind of hand. It's not like you can practice that a hundred times in a day. Like if you play tennis or even chess, you can study a thousand chess problems in a day or a hundred. Tennis, you can practice your serve all day. But I can't practice high stakes psychological situations over and over again in poker. I have to actually be in them. And so you don't really, it's really hard to get good at the psychology of these things. So the best way to keep psychology out of investing is keep position size small. People say, oh, how much should I, what percentage of my portfolio should I invest in a really good stock that I think is going to go up? And they're thinking I'm going to say like 20% of your portfolio or 50% of your portfolio. No, 1%. And then if it goes down, maybe another 1%. Because the idea is, if this is going to skyrocket to the moon, you'll never lose sleep at night and you'll make maybe 100 times your money in a really good investment. Uh, more likely with a private company than a public company. But if you have a big amount that you invested in because you think, oh, this is a home run. I'm going to put all as much money as I can in this because it's definitely going to be a home run. Well, if it simply doubles... It just feels too big to hold on to. You get scared. Oh, am I going to lose this now? I better take it off the table. Whereas if it was small and just keeps growing, you, you're you're constantly playing with the house's money and you can sleep at night and watch your investment grow. Or if you lose uh, the investment or the bet or whatever, you, it's 1% you're down. You don't, It's not a big deal. Like I, always, I have a business partner investing. We always debate, should we put more money in this? And we always determine our exit strategies whenever we put money in. And it always comes out that the math comes out. No matter how much we would put in, according to our exit strategies, we would make the exact same amount of money because we would just get out earlier because we'd be too scared. And we know we're gonna be scared.
That's so interesting because it's so analogous to advice that people give poker players to never put more than about 1% of their net worth into any tournament. Although if it's unless there's like a really um, important exception. Or, um, or if you're running low in a, in a tournament, then you have to switch strategies, you know, and, and you don't have as many choices about picking your spots. You have to kind of play. I mean, well, there's some tournaments like, for instance, the World Series poker main event. First of all, it's easy to get investments for, but also the career opportunities are so massive if you happen to make the final table that... Some people will break that 1% rule. But the idea is not to break it like over and over again until you have no money. Yeah. And then, of course, there's a strategy in in poker as opposed to investing. And there's a strategy you know if everyone else is trying to get to the top 10 and you're, there's 12 players left, you could run over the weaker players just by playing aggressively because you know they're gonna they're trying to hold out. Right, and that's a key issue with having too large of a percentage of your net worth in one particular tournament or game. And also, you know, a lot of poker players were highly invested in cryptocurrency very early. So a lot of what you were saying there, I think kind of reminded me of like some of the both triumphs and struggles that people dealt with. Because to me, it felt like there was such psychological turmoil and triumph in poker for a couple of years as people got so excited, but then we were also filled with so much regret over selling or not selling. And Well, cri- crypto a great example where let's say the world adopts bitcoin as this global currency which many people believe some people don't believe but it's 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 a viable opinion like people can argue it on both sides if crypto there's 150 trillion dollars of currency in the world there's like 100 billion worth of bitcoin in the world so the gains that's like 150,000 percent you can make there's no reason to put a big chunk of money in if you put a thousand dollars in, you're still going to make millions if the Bitcoin dream comes true. And if it goes to zero, okay, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, whatever your your amount is. But if you put like, let's say, you have one hundred fifty thousand dollars in the bank and you put eighty thousand in Bitcoin, you're going to be thinking about it every day, like it's going to rent too much mental real estate in your head. I, I don't like when money rents. Because I I don't like it because I've experienced this too much and I've hated Mm -hmm. it. I don't like when money rents real estate in my head. And then it's it's, it's like this, this totally useless thing taking up too much of my time, energy, sleep. Let's say the Bitcoin dream comes true and you had put in all your money and now it's worth five million. Of course, you're gonna take it off. And maybe you'll miss out on the rest of the game. But if you just put in like 10,000, say, I say just in quotes, I'm making up a number, whatever your right number is, and then and it runs up and the dream is coming true, you might just let it hold. You might run it up to 30 million because, hey, I only put 10,000 in. I don't. I never need to lose sleep over this. Maybe I'll take some gains off along the way. People don't think this way. You want to you wanna keep psychological stress low and... You want to be diversified, which also means you can't put too much in any one investment. In general, you just keep you're, you're more about staying in the game, being diversified across multiple many hands and information gathering. So you're you're play, making enough bets to gather information about your table and the type of hands people play, the type of bluffs people play. I know probably at the highest professional levels, it's a whole different kind of game, but you know, just in general club play or it's you could you could you could roughly use strategies like that. It's really fascinating what you're talking about with these psychological implications of investing and poker. Actually, I gave a talk at Wharton in uh, Philadelphia. A bit of name dropping there. Oh, I gave a talk at Wharton. And well, and one of your and one of your points that from one of your blogs came up as I always love this point. Uh, you talk about negotiating and about how it's very powerful in negotiating to give a very precise number. So rather than like you know fall prey to unit bias and say like I charge like one k for this. You give like a very specific number. And I think that you see this in poker too with like level one betting. People often make it like um, 5,200 if they're they're value betting because they want to get that extra $200. Like they deserve it, right? Whereas if they're bluffing, a lot of times somebody will just throw in a 5K chip. And then obviously on the second level, you reverse the two tendencies, right? I just always love that point about the precision of negotiating. Yeah, because Can you expound on that? If you put out a specific number... The, the automatic level one assumption, uh, as you put it, is that he has a mathematical equation that got him to this number. First off, I could turn the tables. I could say, it's not how much my business can earn, it's how much you'll earn with my business. So I have a thousand customers, you have a million customers, you're gonna make $10 per year for each one of your customers using my 
technology or whatever. So that puts a value of 10 million. If we all agree with the formula in advance, then we could start plugging the numbers. So actually the right way to do it is to say, okay, let's agree how we're gonna value this. Doesn't matter my customers because they're all going away once they get sold. But you have a million customers, each one of your customers we've already seen will generate about $10 in value for you per year, just for the heck of it. So you get a good deal. Let's cut that in half. Do we agree on that formula? And then you start plugging the numbers. Okay, so now it's worth 5 million. And it's hard for them to argue against that if they've already agreed to the formula. And so with poker, you could imagine some similar math. If someone bets $5,250, you could imagine there's some similar math they went through. Like you would think in level one, they're figuring out how much they're able to squeeze out of me. So you assume that they're trying to, that they have like the best, the nuts, the best hand, and they're just trying to tease me in. Of course, level two could mean they're bluffing that they're doing that. And, you know, and then it gets more sophisticated. Yeah, no, I love that point. I just, I mean, it's definitely something I've used, like, for both my talks and also in my life. So it's very valuable. I love how you try to give these finance tips for, like, regular people who, you know, didn't go to, like, uh, business school, don't have an MBA, and don't work in the fields, but they still come across price negotiations in their everyday life. Especially now, as you point out in so much of your work, where people often have side hustles or multiple income streams. So... It's not just like they get a job and there's like a yearly increase in raise. They often have lots of negotiations throughout their their lives. Right. Like you have to get. And here's the thing that people don't realize is that nothing really has any value. It's all fiction, right? Like someone could advertise on this podcast, for instance, and it's just fictional. How much dollars should they pay per thousand listeners? You could say, well, I charge this. And they'll either pay it or not, but then it's a negotiation. So I'm just curious what you think of these other two negotiating ideas and how it might apply to poker. One technique is called anchoring bias. So let's say I have a company that I think, I'm just going to make up numbers. Let's say I have a company I think I can sell for a million, but I'm worried they want to pay less or nothing. I can say, okay, they could say, well, how much do you want? And I could say, well, I'm thinking nine and a half million. And, and they'll just stare for a second and they'll say, oh, I'm just kidding, you know, but now I've anchored their mind at a high number. So when I ask for 3 million and then they negotiate down to one, they think they've scored this huge win when I actually got the number I wanted. So it sounds simplistic, but anchoring bias works. It's a cognitive bias that, that works. Another thing I like to do is a favorite technique of mine. And I'm wondering where this applies in poker because I could see it apply a little is I ask for advice. So someone asks me, uh, like, let's say I was being a consultant. What's your number for this service that you're charging for? Or what's your number to sell this company? Or what's your number for whatever it is? What's your salary number? And I, and my technique there, here is, I call this the advice technique, is I can say, listen, I'm really good at what I do. You're going to get everything you want. And look, I just want to work with you and I want to work with a bigger team. But you're like the... The, I use a chess, you're like the grandmaster of negotiating. You've done this a million times. I'm just this amateur who's good at what I do. That's what I focus on. So let, let me ask you advice. We're going to be working together. We're going to be a team. The only good negotiation is one that's good for everyone. What advice would you give me about what I should ask for? So then they're forced to not give you bad advice because they don't want to, because you just said you're, you're going to be team uh, with them. So they want to give you good advice. They're not going to try to, negotiate you down at that point. And I wonder where that might apply to poker. I think that's one in which actually poker could not be a correlation as much as you would think. Um, A lot of people actually make the opposite point about poker, which I think is a fallacy. So I'm glad you brought that up. In poker, it's very good to have position, which means you want to act last. Some, you know, people will who are trying to make life lessons out of poker will say, well, that's because in negotiation, you want the other person to give the number first. It's just a strategic option that doesn't always exist in real life. So that's why like poker and life are so interrelated, especially because like a poker hand is in a way a mini negotiation. But I think sometimes if you get carried away with the analogy, then it could counter. But I think one way um, that people can make a corollary to life is in poker um, is that if they haven't gotten embarrassed by having their bluff called in the last few months, rather than thinking that they're the best bluffer ever, they might need to reassess whether they're bluffing enough. There's this concept in persuasion and in negotiation called frame control. So that in a high stakes situation, like a negotiation or like a poker hand, one person has the frame, meaning they have the the, the attention and the and they have some degree of control over everyone else and what everyone else is thinking and paying attention to. So it's obvious like in a talk, the person on the stage most likely has the frame. 
it would be a very bad talk if someone in the audience had more of the frame than the person on the stage with the microphone. In poker, I find a lot of the great players have a lot of presence at the table. Like they kind of dominate the discussion or the conversation or the flow at the table. So sometimes people then, you're afraid to bet against the person who controls the frame because who knows what could happen. Or maybe you want to be in their favor so they're not betting against you or whatever. And even when I used to play a long time ago, in Las Vegas against people who are super famous poker players now, I would notice they had always such good chatter at the table and they would just they would just dominate the personality of the table. I think that's interesting that you say that because there are also a lot of introverts now in poker, but you're right that there's a certain energy that, you know, really strong players give off, like they deserve that space. Um, I want to move on to side hustles because poker is getting tougher. And so a lot of people are finding that it's a good idea to save their poker hours for when there's a really awesome game, but then also do things on the side. Why do you think poker is getting tougher? Because everyone knows all the statistics and all the basic strategies and so on? Um, Yeah, just generally. And, and also there's even more math, which is great for somebody like me who comes from a chess background, but some people find that they don't want to go down that road, that they came to poker because they like the people reading and the light map. They don't really want to go and like, you know, we have these things called solvers now in poker, which is like very similar to like studying with like, you know, Fritz or Stockfish and chess base and creating databases of different like opening trees and like game trees. And it's just not everybody's cup of tea. Like some people just didn't come to poker for that. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays 
under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll sign up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. How much of poker right now do you think is math versus uh, re- reading other people? For well, you, how, what's the percentage? Right I think now? online, it's it's way more math. Live, it's still a lot of, there's still a lot of like reading people. Even if it's not like just reading them, it's also just kind of reading the room and the tendencies of people to like, like what we were talking about, like betting 5,200 instead of 5, 5K. Like just kind of like knowing like what the tendencies are of people. So there's still quite a lot of that. And I think there's just this pressure that people think they need to be like mathematicians now. So some people are like, okay, I love poker and I'm still going to play it forever, but I need some side hustles. What do you think a poker player who has this resume gap is best suited to? Well, it's interesting because let's take many people you and I know, they're, they're not just good at poker. They're good at chess. They're good at backgammon. They're good at, they're, they're, they've probably never had a, a job in their lives because they're just killers at games. They will, they sit down at a table and they think I'm going to kill everyone who opposes me no matter what the game is, whether it's, Poker, backgammon, chess, bridge, whatever. And so they, you see a lot of like chess masters become poker champions or world backgammon champions become chess players and then poker, ch- usually it's the other way, chess to backgammon to poker. But you see people who are, if they're a killer at one game, they're probably a killer at, at the others. And so that's a particular personality and they're not quite set up mentally to let's say run a business <laughs> Because they 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 just think about killing people, <laughs> and I mean that almost very directly. Like they they will destroy annihilate anyone in front of them, and that's how they're thinking. Like how can I destroy this person's mind? So I think side hustles for me that implies not a business, but a, a way to offer a service that's a good stream of of income. So for instance, figuring out other arbitrages. So when when Bitcoin was going crazy, this is just one example. It doesn't work now, but it's one example. When Bitcoin was going crazy, you could buy Bitcoin on a Korean exchange for, let's say, I'll make up a number, 9,000. And then you could immediately sell it on like a Philip, a random Philippine smaller exchange for 9,500. That's like less liquid and more local in the Philippines. So I think game players are good at figuring out these arbitrages, these spreads where you can buy something for X and then sell it for X plus 20%. So, so there are some side hustles that lend itself to that. For instance, you could buy from a factory in Africa a t shirt for a dollar and then immediately sell it on Amazon. For twenty dollars, uh, just like a plain white cotton T-shirt, or you don't even have to buy it. You figure out the arbitrage further. You could say, "Well, I'm going to sell it first on Amazon, then I'm going to order it from Africa and have the Africa play- factory ship directly to the customer." So that's called drop shipping. But there's lots of, you know, at first there was a an arbitrage opportunity between Alibaba, which is like let's call it the Amazon slash eBay of China, and Amazon. There was an arbitrage there. Now there's other sites around the world or there's directly with factories so i feel like game players are good at figuring out those types of arbitrages and there are many in the world so for instance here's an arbitrage i don't know what to do with this information there's all sorts of regulations and laws about it so what i'm recommending is semi-illegal but like marijuana in colorado is about one eighth the price of marijuana in new york 
for good reason. It's recreationally legal there. It's not recreationally legal here. You can't really, there's all sorts of re weird regulations about transporting it over state lines. So is there something to be done with that spread? Can you buy it super cheap now in Colorado, store it there, wait a few months for it to become recreationally legal in New York, and then ship it over and sell it here, you know, for, for $20 or 15 I don't know. But there's always these opportunity. So I think I think investing is always a, a, a good thing for, for game players to look into, looking for these kind of opportunities to buy something low, sell it high. That could be with stocks. It could be with private companies. It could be with Bitcoin. It could be with objects like buying something on Alibaba, selling it on Amazon. It could be with real estate. If a US citizen were to go to Panama and buy an apartment, they can negotiate a better discount than a Panamanian because Panamanian real estate developers want Americans to fill up some of their apartments of their of the projects they're completing. Let's say a building's half finished. They want to pre-sell to some Americans because that will attract Panamanians like, oh, this is a this is a great deal. So Americans can get a discount there. So that becomes a side hustle, which is sort of partnering with a bunch of people and buying different apartments around the world where GDP is growing faster than real estate. And you could find these deals where Americans get a little bit of a discount and then you get a further discount if you buy into a building that's not finished yet. So, or going meta on that, finding the opportunities and then calling up all of your rich friends and saying, hey, I got an opportunity for you. Here it is. I don't have the money for it. You do. I'll take care of all the paperwork, make the investment, and I'll take 10% of your profits. No fee upfront, I'll take 10% of your profits. So that's a potential side hustle. Now going one level up, you can say, I've found 20 of these real estate opportunities all around the world. So you'll have a diversified real estate uh, portfolio where there's almost no risk because these various discounts, and you sell that information for $5,000, which is like a fraction of what people will make. And maybe they'll make millions if they do it right. And so they'll be happy to pay $5,000 to get all the information from you. So this way you have no risk. You did all the work to find the information and find these, how to play the game a little better in ways that other people haven't. And then you sell that information. And that's totally scalable. It, it almost requires no cost from you. And yet you can make a, a, a lot of money. So, and that's just one specific situation. I can think of 20 others. That's great. I mean, I think it's so valuable. And I know one of your um, ideas that you've talked about a lot is writing just lots and lots of ideas and not caring if they're stupid, um, whether it's creative ideas or money-making ideas, um, just to make sure that you're considering every angle and to like boost your creativity. Yeah, it's really important because... People think two things. One is, I have a great idea. I hope nobody steals it, so I gotta be careful who I tell. So that's like the scarcity complex that they're only gonna have so many ideas in life and they have to hold on to them like they're precious little babies. But a much better way is to build your idea muscle. It's a muscle like any other. And you could give out ideas, good ideas all day for free because you're always gonna have this abundance of ideas if you keep exercising this muscle. So I write down 10 ideas every day. They don't have to be business ideas. They could be ideas about anything, but they have to be hard enough that it's hard to come up with 10. So it could be 10 business ideas, it could be 10 book ideas, or maybe I'll have uh, 10 ideas for newsletters I could sell, like I just described this real estate one, or it could be 10 ways Amazon can improve the way it uh, lets people advertise their books. So now maybe I could give that information to Amazon or I could build a company that does it for Amazon. There's lots of choices. Once you have a bunch of good ideas, you could give it away for free and that creates uh, a connection and, and that helps your networking, particularly if they're good ideas, or you could do it yourself. And since it's, you know it's so great for Amazon, you think Amazon's a potential buyer. Or I can say, huh, nobody, I'm gonna search which books on Amazon have a high ranking, but very few books in the category. Meaning a lot of people want this type of book, but there are very few books written in that category. So for instance, a friend of mine did this and he got a three book deal overnight for military romance. Apparently all military romance books were ranking really high, but there were like four books in the category. So there was enormous demand that wasn't being met. So he write, the next day he got a three book deal to write wow. military romance. Wow, was he an novels. expert in, was he a- Zero. Oh. So he hired a ghostwriter off of Fiverr for like $100 to, per book. So there's, again, that's an arbitrage. You find an opportunity where there's no one else and you don't worry about how you, it's sort of a ready, fire, aim approach. So ready is, getting ready is getting your idea muscle work. Firing is getting the ideas and then taking the first steps to execute on them. And then finally aiming is, well, I got this three book deal, now what? I don't know anything about the military or romance. 
So I better find someone who does. And then you just, that's an e- that's the easiest part. Then you just, okay, you could take 10% of the profits and I'll pay you $200 or whatever. Coming up with ideas allows you to take advantage of so many situations. And people are, are always think, oh, well, when the right moment comes, inspiration will hit. I'm smart enough, inspiration mm-hmm. will hit. But it doesn't. Like You have to exercise it every single day. You can't miss a day. And if you do that, within three months, you'll know, you'll feel the difference in your brain. Like your brain will make more connections than, than it did before. Like you'll sense it. And after six months, you also are much better at executing. People think ideas are, are a dime a dozen, execution is everything, but they forget that execution ideas are a subset of ideas. I've seen people execute a good idea poorly and fail, or you can execute a bad idea very well and succeed. There's a big spectrum in, in people's ability to execute and exercising that idea muscle makes you better at executing. Do you actually write them with a pen and paper or is it usually just typed out on an Word doc? Pen and paper. Yeah. Uh-huh. And is that, do you think that's significant as well? Or is it potential that like that's age related, like a uh, millennial or something that just wouldn't help them? I don't know. I've heard there's some evidence that when you write things down on pen or pencil or whatever, you, it goes into your memory more. But I do all of my writing just on the computer. It's just like if I'm out at a cafe and I've got, I like using this waiter's pad because you can't. I can't go in depth. The lines are small. So I can't, I have to just bullet point my 10 ideas. I can't write like a whole novel here. I have to just one, two, three. So, so it forces me to be concise on the idea and then I'm done with the 10 ideas for the day. So that's why I use specifically a pen and this waiter's pad as opposed to a computer for the ideas. But for writing, I always use a computer. I can't, I can't write a whole article. Right. Those are just for the ideas themselves. Fascinating. Is there anything that you would recommend um, poker players to get started in terms of making themselves more wealthy and successful in your own writings? Like which book would you direct them to first? Uh, Definitely my favorite book that I've done is a book called Choose Yourself, which talks a lot about how I went broke repeatedly by not following any of the advice I've just said here, by just making every possible mistake and then being very forthright and open about what my mistakes were, how I recovered first from kind of a psychological level, because if you're constantly going broke, there's something wrong other than just, you know, you're not having the right ideas or the economy went bad. There's something wrong with you if you're constantly messing up. You kind of have to take ownership of your own mistakes. And then I start to get into more specifics about how you can find ideas that work for you. Everyone's gonna have different ideas. And then I wrote Choose Yourself, the Choose Yourself Guide to Wealth, reinvent yourself. And I have another book coming out in a year that's going to be by far the best of all because it it, it takes the last five, six years of me thinking all this out. But Choose Yourself, which I wrote in 2013, is a great start and people still still buy it and still read it. Oh, I read that. I loved it. And I love what you wrote about also in general um, on your blogs and your writing about giving away ideas for free and not just ideas like connections. Like if you hear that somebody is looking for this type of person, really um, doing your best to try to make those connections and not be jealous or protective, like, oh, I might need that later. Can I give two examples? Yeah. So most of the time I write a list of ideas. The goal is to exercise the idea muscle, not to make a lot of money off of that one list. Because I'm writing 10 ideas, 365 days a year. So that's 3,650 ideas. I might not even execute on one of them, but at most I would execute on just two or three. So most ideas you just throw out and and it's just there to exercise the idea muscle. But I did write to Amazon, here's 10 things you could do to make self-publishing easier because I've self-published a lot of books as well as published with regular publishers, but I had ideas for Amazon to make that process easier. So Amazon invited me out. Uh, I, I, I saw everything they were working on out in Seattle and I made a ton of connections. It was really great for me and great for my books. So that was one thing. And then uh, I've done the same with Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, Quora, many different companies where I went out, I ended up getting invited to visit with them and I had fascinating meetings and I learned a lot and I built connections at each company and so on. The other example, which had more immediate use was when I first started doing this, I was dead broke, had nothing and I wanted to get into the investing space. So first I wrote to 20 people and said, hey, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. Can I have five minutes of your time and ask you some questions? And nobody even responded. They didn't say no. They didn't even respond because it was such, it's just so stupid to approach people that way, offering zero value. So then I really researched each person. Like it wasn't like Warren Buffett was, was going to say, stop, Gladys, stop everything. 
somebody from New York named James Aldisher wants to buy me a 60 cent cup of coffee, I've got to... I've got to see him. So it's not like that's going to happen. So then what I did was I, re I researched every person pretty heavily. Like I read one guy's PhD thesis. I read another person's, uh, you know, how, how all their investment strategies. And I wrote specific ideas for each person, how they can improve their business. And I said, I want nothing in return. I don't want to meet you. Just here's 10 ideas I thought about. I really admired this, this, this. And then here's 10 ideas based on what I know about you. Out of the 20, three responded. Eventually one of them started me on my, I gave him 10 ideas for articles he should write. And he ended up hiring me as a writer. And then he ended up buying a company I started for millions of dollars, uh, just four years later. Another guy invested money with me. And I ended up building a hedge fund with his initial investment as a starter investment. Another guy said, okay, let's have lunch. I didn't respond to him because I was so happy with the other two. I responded to him 12 years later. And I said, well, instead of lunch, how about come on my podcast? This was in 2014 from a letter from 2002. I hit reply. And he <laughs> said, whoa, but okay. And that's when Nassim Taleb, who's a well-known financial writer, uh, came on my podcast. No way. That's so great. Yeah, 12 so, years. So you went back all the way in your inbox. Yeah. That's that's amazing. Oh, wow. So inspo. To and, and by the way, my first list of 10 ideas were I wanted to come up with chapter titles for uh, a book I wanted to write. How to Beat Your Friends and Family at Every Game in the Universe. Not your family, which is different. <laughs> but you're the average family. You go home for Thanksgiving, someone brings out the Scrabble board or the chessboard or the checkerboard or wants to play hearts or bridge. And with most of those games, if you know like three or four little tips, you can crush anybody who doesn't know the tips. Again, not your family. but uh, <laughs> Yeah, Greg. <laughs> Greg, or your, or your dad. So, <laughs> so I figured, okay, chess, checkers, go, bridge, poker, spades, hearts, you know, and then and Monopoly, Scrabble. And and then I made little sub lists, like what would be the three tips for each one of those games. Oh, that's brilliant. I really like uh, the work of Nassim Talib. So that's a, such a great story. So after playing poker for a full year, just to go back, like I read that you quit cold turkey after losing a big pot to Irv Gotti. Actually, I played Irv Gotti a, a few years after I stopped playing that time. So it's like 1999, one poker player was saying to me, like, why are you doing this? Why don't you start a business? So I did and lost all my money. I wish I had stayed playing poker instead, which was a lot safer for me, as, as odd as that sounds. But then a few years later, uh, I was hanging out with Lenny Barshak. Do you know Lenny Barshak? No. So he's a, he was a big poker player, like in the clubs here i guess he never really and he was an entrepreneur also so i was hanging out with him and he's like there's this big game happening at murder inc records which is irv Gotti's record label and he's like you know david schwimmer goes there blah 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 goes there all these people go there he named all these names none of whom were at this game so we went to the game and there's somebody patting everyone down and irv Gotti was this he was like and by the way ingrid who i had known six or seven years earlier from the mayfair was dealing at murder inc records so I sit down at Irv, there were two tables. I sit down at Irv's table. The guy next to me had just produced the movie 300. So he was just living off that money. And Irv was one of those people who he controlled the frame at the table. Like he was, you know, loud. If you bet, if you bet like quietly, he would just like throw chips like in your face. He's just like dominating the table. You just almost didn't want to get in his way. And I had a good hand after a while. And it was, you know, we bet a few rounds. I was raising. And then he goes all in. I, I go all in. I had like a huge hand. He had absolutely nothing. And then the runner runner gave him like a straight, something like that. I can't, I forget the exact details of the game, but I remember it was runner runner specifically. And he's like, ah, you suck. And <laughs> he's like bringing all the money in. It was a lot of money. And I figured, okay, this is just insane. And so I left. I didn't want to play anymore. But I wrote about it in the Financial Times the next day. And Lenny calls me and Lenny's like, do you, do you want to get yourself killed? Like, Irv Gotti's like very upset. If he sees this article, you're like a dead man. And I'm like, why? You're allowed to play cards? And he's like, no, you're not. <laughs> it's not a private club. You can't, he can't have a game like this going. He's going to get in trouble. And then he's going to kill me because I brought you to the game. And that's the last time I spoke with Lenny. And that's the last time you played poker for a while. Yeah, that's the last time I played for a while. Then I, when um, we have this mutual friend, um, Maria Konnikova, sh she and I have played over the years. In the past couple of years, as you know, she's been studying under Eric and, and playing in tournaments and getting really good. And so we've played heads up a couple of times or, or maybe with one other person on occasion. And then I played at the I played like random games. I played at this Clinton Foundation event and just random randomly I play. That hand with Irv Gotti, um, what hand did you have? I can't remember now, but it was it was a high hand. Like I had a set or something. Not eight the, five off. No, not eight five off. I, I had like like a set of kings, something like that on the flop. But it was like 
king nothing nothing. So I knew he couldn't have had a better hand. Like maybe it was like king five two, and then he ends up with an ace six doing a straight or some some weird straight he got on the the turn in the river. He was betting so confidently as if he it was like he knew that I'm not I'm not accusing him of anything obviously, but. He was betting so confidently, I was scared, even though I can clearly see he had like a 3% chance of, of winning the hand after we turned our cards over, but he, he got the hand. Oh, that's such a great story. Well, you're swan song in poker, um, but you still are involved and you still use it to, you know, make some of your blogs. You you make points about poker and chess. So A, I like intensely got into it. Like I was, when I wasn't playing, I was studying it. I never slept that year. And I always keep up and, and read books on poker and so on. And I've taught my kids poker and, and I still play a little bit. Thank you, James, so much for the, your time. It was phenomenal. Obviously, people can follow you at jamesaltucher.com and subscribe to your podcast on Apple. Um, come to your comedy club in New York, Stand Up New York. Most and- important of all, yeah, come to my comedy club, Stand Up New York, 78th and Broadway. If, you even, if you're listening to Jen's podcast, email me at altucher.gmail.com and I'll comp you and all your friends in, free drinks, everything. Awesome. I'm going to have to take you off on that, too. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Thanks for listening to thepokergrid.com. Please subscribe, review, and tell your friends about your favorite episode. If you want to support my projects, consider a tax-deductible donation to U.S. Chess Women. We are working to even the mind sports playing field by bringing more women and girls into chess. Till next time, as we count down 169 hands. No one ever bust. They say I'm lucky. Oh no, no need to bluff. With all the cheap tricks up my sleeve. Yeah, I got talent. You won't see me, see me stunting. No, never, never stagger. Believe it, I'm the real thing. Looking to save big on holiday shopping? Xfinity Mobile has you covered. Now through January 10th, ask how existing Xfinity customers can get a free unlimited intro line for a year when they buy one line of unlimited. Plus, see how to get $400 off an eligible 5G phone. Visit XfinityMobile.com, call 1-800-XFINITY, or visit a store today. Restrictions apply. Xfinity Mobile requires Xfinity Internet. Reduce speeds after 20 gigabytes of usage per line. Data thresholds may vary.